Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Easy Agile podcast. Uh, my name is Amar Iftikhar. I'm a product manager here at Easy Agile. And before we begin, uh, Easy Agile would like to acknowledge the, tra the traditional custodians of the land from which we broadcast today, the people of the Darwal speaking country. We pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and extend that same respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, and First Nations peoples joining us today. Today, we have on the podcast, John Kern, who is the co-author of the Agile Manifesto for Software Development and an Agile Consultant. If you're wondering you're, that you're correct, I did mention the Agile Manifesto for Software Development, the Agile Manifesto. So John, um, welcome for being here and, and thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Amar. Thank you. Yeah, very excited to have you on. Um, uh, let's just get started with the absolute basic. Tell me uh, or tell the audience about what is the Agile Manifesto? Well, it's uh, something that if if you weren't around, and I know you're young, so you weren't around uh, 21 years ago, I guess now, to, to maybe understand the landscape of what software development process and tooling and and kind of what we were, what most of us were facing back then, it might seem like a really obvious set of really simple values, right? It's who who, who could think that there's anything wrong with what what's uh, what we put into the manifesto? But back in the day, there were what I practiced under as a I'm an aerospace engineer, so I was into defense department work doing things like fighter simulation f-14 flat spins and working with you know the centrifuge and cool stuff like that and subject to a mill standard specification which makes sense for probably weapon systems and aircraft manufacturing and all, all sorts of other things but they had one lo and behold for software development and so there was a very large, what I would call heavy handedness around software development process. We call it heavyweight process. Waterfall is the common term back then and probably still used today. And there were plenty of, I would say the, the, the marketing juggernaut of the day, IBM and rational unified process, these large, very, very much like safe where it's a really large body of work, awesome amount of information in it, but very heavy process. Uh, even though everything would say you tailor it, it could be whatever you want. I, I mapped my own lightweight process in, into RUP, for example, sure. But <clears throat> the reality was we were facing uh, a, kind of the, the marketplace leader being heavyweight process that was just soul crushing and from my perspective, wasting taxpayers' money. That was kind of my angle was, well, I'm a taxpayer. I'm not going to just do this stupid process for process sake. You know, it has to have some value. It has to be pragmatic. So right. lo and behold, there were a handful of us, 17 ended up there, but there are a handful of us that practice more lightweight methods. So the manifesto is really <clears throat> an opportunity for coming together and discovering some of the what you might think of as the commonality between many different lightweight practices there was the xp contingent i first learned about scrum there for example ari van benekum a good friend he he taught us about dsdm i don't remember what it stands for anymore it was a european thing um you know alistair and jim highsmith they had I forget who, like crystal methodologies. So there was a fair amount of, of other processes that did not have the marketing arm that RUP did or didn't have the mill standard. So it was really all about what could we find amongst ourselves that was some sort of common theme about all these lightweight processes. Mm -hmm. So it was all about discovering that, really. You all get together... Um you know, the, the, the principles kind of come to fruition and 
let's fast forward a little bit. What was the initial reaction to the original manifesto? Yeah, it was it was even kind of funny that the um the like the four values, the four bullets is as you know, as simple as it was. Because the, the principles came a bit later. I, I want to say, you know, we collaborated over over Ward's wiki. But the the original like the if you go to Agile Uprising, you can see I, I uploaded some artifacts because I'm I, apparently I'm a pack rat, and I had doc you know I had like the original documents that you know Alistair probably printed out because he he's the one they he and Jim lived there in near Salt Lake City, so it was you know I was like hey let's come here and you know we like to go skiing so let's yeah, let's yeah. do it here, <laughs> so he arranged the room and everything and. So there's some funny artifacts that you can find. And, um, you know, the the way that it actually came about was an initial introduction of each of us about our methods. And really, the I think a key, we left our egos at the door. I mean, I was a younger one, you know, Uncle Bob, you know, some of these, these like he was a luminary. I, I know I have magazines still in the barn that have that he was either the editor of or authors of, you know, for people who don't remember what magazines are, you know, small little booklets <laughs> that came out frequently. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Uncle Bob was like, oh, wow, this is pretty cool. And and I wasn't shy because <clears throat> I had a lot of experience with heavyweight methods. So I really wanted to weigh in on on because I, I had published my own lightweight method um, a few years earlier. So I had a lot of opinions on how to kind of avoid like the, the, the challenges of a big heavyweight process. So the culmination as we were going out the door and after we had come up with the four values <clears throat> was, I think Ward said, sure, want me to put this on the web? And again, this is 2001. So you know, dot com and the web's still kind of new so to speak yep and we're all like yeah sure why not what the hell can't hurt you know might you know we, we got something might as well publish it the, the the i don't think to a person anybody said oh yeah this is gonna set the world on fire because we're so awesome right and, and you know you know we we we're gonna you know, anoint the world with all of this wonderful wisdom. So there was, I don't think anybody was thinking that, that much would happen. Yeah. So, so what were you thinking at that time? Like, it. so like, how, how would, you know, the, the, the principles that you had come, come up with together, um, was that maybe just for the team to take away, like everyone who was there, what, what, what was the plan at that time? I think it was a common practice. Like I said, um, there were other groups that would often meet and have little consortiums or little gatherings um, and then publish something. So mm -hmm. I think it was just, oh, uh, yeah, I, you know, that's a normal thing to do is, yeah, you spend some time together and you wrote things down. You might as well, quote, publish it. So I, I think it wasn't any deeper than that, other than Bob. I think Bob might say that he he wanted to to come up with some kind of a, a manifesto of sorts or some kind of a document because that's I think what those sort of I was never at one of those gatherings, but you know you could you could see that they did publish things. You so I have a feeling it was just something as innocent as well we you know talked wrote some things down might as well share it and then the <clears throat> the principles. Yeah, there there were a lot of different practices in the room. So, some of the what I would say the the beauty the beauty of the even the values page is the humility at the top is it's still active voice like we are uncovering not hey all peasants we figured it all out no it's we're we're still uncovering it and the other thing is you know by doing it. Because we're, you know, I'm still active, uh, active coder. So, and plus the we value this more, you know, on the left more than that on the right. That the kind of the ambi some people might say it's a little ambiguous or a little fuzzy, 
Mm -hmm. That's also a sign of humility in that it's not, you know, A or B. And it really is fuzzy. And you need to understand your context enough to apply these things. So from a defense department contracting point of view, you know, certainly three of the four bullets, you know, were really important to me because I learned, yeah, the, you know, sir, we did defense department contracting, but it's way more important to develop a rapport with the customer than it is. Because by the time you get to the contract, you've already lost. Yeah. Know, or, you know, which which goes along with with get, developing a rapport, you know, with the customer, the individual, the uh, and and one of Peter Codes when when we worked with cust customers and whatnot, one of our mantras was frequent, tangible working results, aka working software. Right? You can draw a lot and you can, you know, do use cases for nine months, but if you don't have anything running, you know, it's pretty pretty. Uh, I would guess risky, you know, that you don't yeah. have anything you know, working software yet. So um, you know, it really was, I think, an opportunity to to share the fact that some people thought two weeks and other people thought a month. You know, even some of the print some of the principals had a pretty good wide ranging um, flexibility, so to speak. So yeah, um, that I think was is really important to note. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and it makes sense. Um, did you, you know, did you or anyone else in the room at that time um, ever imagine uh, what the impact downstream would be of the, of the work that was being done there? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I certainly did not. I mean, it's, um, I, I remember a couple times in my career walking in and seeing some some diagrams when i when i work with uh our, the company together soft and we you know built some cool stuff and i'd see people having some of the oh yeah there's a diagram i remember making you know on their wall that's kind of cool but nothing near how humbling and sort of satisfying it is Spe especially i i would say oh, oh. When I'm in India or Colombia or Greece, or it, it almost seems maybe they're more willing to be emotional about it, but people are. It's, it's almost like they were freed by this document, and in some sense, of the, this is a really, really tiny, saying it with the most humility possible, but a little bit like the Declaration of Independence and the the fact that you know a handful of of people in, in the constitution of the United States, a handful of people met, you know, in a moment of time, never to be repeated again, and created something that was on, you know, dropped on the the world, so to speak, mm -hmm. that unleashed, unleashed a tremendous amount of individual freedom and confidence to do things. <clears throat> and I think of the in a very small, you know, similar fashion, that's what the manifesto did. As you mentioned, there's like a point in time when when the manifesto was developed. And you know, that was almost over 20 years ago. So now the way of working and the world of working has, you know, drastically changed. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Do you see another version coming do you, do you think there's certain updates that need to be made do you think it's it's kind of a timeless document uh, i'd love to hear your thoughts on that yeah that's a that's a that's a good question i personally think it's timeless <clears throat> and i welcome other people to create different documents and they have you know uh, agile has like the heart uh, i mean alistair has the the heart of agile um josh karevsky's got you know, modern agile uh, right there there's a there's a few variations of a theme and, and different different things to to uh, reflect upon which i think is great because i do believe you know un unlike the u.s constitution which built built in a mechanism to amend itself you know like i don't think you know we, we didn't need that <clears throat> and i believe it captured the essence of how humans work together to produce something of value mostly software because that's what we we came to practice from as a software experience 
Right. But it doesn't take a lot of imagination to replace the word software with product or something like that and still apply much of the of the values that are there with very, very minor, maybe, you know, adjustments because frequent tangible working results. Okay. There might have to be models because you're not going to like build a skyscraper and tear it down and say, oh, that wasn't quite right. And build it again. But nonetheless, there are, you know, variations of, of how you can show some frequent results. So I think by and large, it's, it's, it's timeless. And I, I would challenge anybody you know, what's wrong with it point point out something that's somehow not true 20 years later and i think right. that's the genius behind it uh was we we stumbled on and probably because most of us were object modelers that's one of the things we're you know we're really good at is is distilling the essence of of a system into you know the, the most critical pieces that's kind of what modeling is all about and so i think somehow innately we got down to the the core bits that make up uh you know what what it is to to produce software with people process and tools and we wrote it down that's why i think it's timeless yeah no absolutely i think that was a really good you know explanation about why why, why it's timeless. I think one of the principles that kind of comes to mind um, in a kind of modern hybrid or flexible working arrangement um, is, you know, the, the, one, of the, one of the principles uh, talks about the importance of face-to-face -face conversations. Um, uh, and, you know, in a world now where a lot of conversations aren't happening physically face-to-face, -face, they might be happening on Zoom. Um, do you think that Kind of, do you think that that still applies? Yeah, I think what what we're finding out with um, you know re remote was literally re remote, so to speak, back you know twenty years ago. I was working with uh, a team of developers in Russia, and we had established enough trust and and physical. Like I, I would travel there. Uh, every month <clears throat> so kind of established enough of a team and, an, and enough trust in the communication that we could we could do alternately some asynchronous work because different time zones and, and me being in the east coast u.s you know seven seven a.m in russia was like i mean seven a.m in the u.s was maybe three p.m in russia if i recall st petersburg you know so we we were able to overcome the distance, but it's hard to beat real life. And and I would often, sometimes even even spar a little bit with Ron Jeffries that on the one hand, you could say the the best that you can do is in person, but on the other hand, I could argue a little bit of some of the remoteness makes things you have to be a little more verbose possibly a little more precise but also a little more verbose a little more relaxed you know with it might take take a <clears throat> couple of passes to get something just because you, I mean you're sort of two time zones passing in the night but that that was based off of then some often initial face-to-face -face meetings and then you could go remote and be still be successful and highly effective so I think it's important that teams don't just, you know, say that they, they can still do everything. And like Zoom is way better than 20 years ago, admittedly. You know, Zoom Zoom gets, at least you can see face, but um, nothing replaces the, the human contact. And I think um, also for well-being, I think human contact is important. Yeah. So, you know, I, I wouldn't, I, I would still say that the 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 interaction aspect in the manifesto is still best served with a healthy dose of in person and that that's kind of the key about most things in the in agile it's to me it's about pragmatism and not just being dogmatic but rather well, what what might work better for us and even experimenting with try something a little bit 
and see how that works. You know, so, um, you know, even how you treat the manifesto, you should treat it in an agile manner, so to speak. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, kind of on that note, as an agile consultant or the the agile guy, you know, what have you seen or um, the the best practices or what works, what what doesn't work for distributed teams? Well, I think the the things that are most challenging that that, I, that I've run across big companies and even smaller ones is the the natural. I don't know if it's natural. It, God forbid if it's natural, but tendencies that I've seen in some companies is to set up silos mm. where you're the quality control, you're the UX, you're the front end, you're the back end. Makes my head want to explode um because that's that's building in a lag and building in communication roadblocks and building in um cooperation which is handoffs from silo to silo versus c collaboration so that I've seen more of that and I get it. You know, you might want to have a specialty, but customer doesn't care. Customer wants something out the door. If I showed up and I'm, and I'm going to pull a feature off the stack, what do you mean? I can only do part of it. Like, I don't get that. And, you know, yeah, I, I know I'm not an expert in everything, but we probably have an expert that we can figure out what the pattern is. So I, I find that sort of, um trend i don't know if it's a trend but I, I find that's like a step backwards in my in my opinion and and it's better to try to be more you know cross-functional collaborative everybody trying to work to get the feature out the door not just trying to do your little part yeah 100 so, percent um, I think you know knocking on silos is like a big part of you know being agile or even being digital for that matter. Um, but and and often like the rep the remedies for it too are um are there or they're at, at hand, but it's a lot harder to actually you know be practical with it, to actually implement it in an organization, a living, breathing business, uh, where there's real people. Um, and there's dynamics to deal with, and there's kind of policies and processes to follow. So, um, I guess as generic as you can be, you know, what would what is your thought, um, you know, as as an agile consultant to a business that's kind of facing that issue? I like to one um, one of the things that you know, at Adaptivist, what my my colleague John Turley has really opened my eyes to. Uh, I tend to call it a, a kind of a the secret sauce or the missing piece to my practice, or and it has to do with individuals' mindset and what we call like vertical development. So it might sound like weird, wishy washy, fluffy stuff, but it's actually super critical. And I've always said people process and tools for I want to say since late nineties, probably. I mean, a long time. And it's the first time I've been able to realize why sometimes I would have just spectacular, super high performing teams. And other times it'd be just, you know, really, really well performing, but not always that spark. And, you know, some, sometimes kind of like, eh, that was a little meh. And a lot of it comes down to where, where people lie on, on in, in terms of how they make their meaning and what their motivational orientation is, you know, command and control versus autonomy. So what we do is we, we've learned that we can help people, first off, recognize this exists and help people with what we call developmental practices. Something that, you know, that even the phrase, you probably heard it, like safe experiments, you know, like failure or trying something and, fail, you know, failing, well, if you chop someone's head off for it, guess what? They're going to just going to probably stay pretty still and only do what they're told. Not try to, you know, I've, I've always, I have, I have a super high dose of autonomy in me. 
So, you know, I will have long lived by the better to beg forgiveness than ask permission. And I always felt that as long as I'm trying to do the right thing to succeed and do the best for the company, they probably won't fire me <laughs> if I make a mistake. But not everybody has that that amount of, um, you know, that that, that freedom in, in the way they, they work. So you you have to help establish that as management and and and, and you know that that's that's a big thing that we we work with with teams and then we also start with the classic if you've ever watched office space and if you haven't you should but the you know what is it that you do here so there's a great you know the, the consultants bob and bob coming in like the efficiency consultants you know so Omar, what is it that you do here um, yeah. but literally that's something whether whether we're helping teams build a new product is okay what's the purpose what's the business purpose of this product what is it that you do here you know what do you want to do with this product what value does it provide same thing you know with anything you're working with a, as a team and that's why <clears throat> whether it's software you know producing some feature that, that has an outcome that provides value to the customer or some product but the point is if you don't understand that okay now now it's making the, the team is going to have a, a real hard time being able to make decisions which are helping us move forward. So if if you help everybody understand what it is we're here to do, and then try to get the folks that might reflect uh, all the different silos, if you're siloed, but you know all the different elements, like how do we get go from an idea to cash, so to speak, or idea to value in the customer's hand, and have a good look at that. And really, because there's so many things that just sort of, you know, technical debt often creeps into software code bases and the same thing, you know, we sort of say the organizational debt, the same thing can happen. Your mm -hmm. process debt, that you can just end up with, all right, we want the development team to go faster, John and company, can you come in and, and help coach us? And, you know, we want to go agile. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. You know, we roll up our sleeves, we look around and, and like, a after an initial, you know, kind of this value stream look like, wait. I'm sorry, but there's a little tiny wedge. It's about 15%. That's the development. And then, you know, you spent the 85% thinking about it. Like, yeah, the, we could, you know, let's pretend we could double the speed of development, which was initially the, yeah, we need the developers to code faster or something, right? That's, it's a classic. And yeah. no, you don't, you need to stop doing all this bullshit up front. That's just crazy ass, like, big waterfall projecty stuff with multiple sign-offs and matter of fact one of the sign-offs oh my gosh it only meets once a week and then you know if you have like a, a typo in it you get rejected you don't come back for another like are you insane you spent like eight months deciding to do eight weeks worth of work sorry it's not the eight weeks right and so things like that you know, like what i recommend anybody self-inspect is try to you know, if you're worried about your team, how, how you could do better is just start trying to write down what is what does your process step look like and what is a typical time frame? How much time are you putting value into the because a lot of times people batch things up in sprints, right? That's a batch. Why are you putting things in a batch? Or they have giant issues. Well, that's a big batch. So you know, there's there's lots of often low-hanging fruit but to your point it's it's often in, in encrusted in this is the way we work and you know it's nobody feels the the ability to change or even to stop and look to see how are we working so i think that's you know that, that's where we usually start is let's see how you actually work today and then while we're doing that you can spill your guts you can tell us all the things that hurt and they're painful and then we'll try to design a better way that we can move towards in, in terms of uh, working more effectively because our goal is to help teams be able to um, develop ways to do more meaningful and joyous work really because it's it's a lot of fun when it's clicking and when you're on a good team and you're you're putting smiles on the customers faces it it's it's hard to, to to almost stay away from work because it's so much fun. But if it's not that, if it's drudgery and you're just uh, 
a cog in the machine and stuff takes months to get out the door. It's really, it's, it's a job. It's, you know, not that much fun. Yeah. Anyway, that's, no, I've, yeah. I've, a lot of the points that you mentioned there, like high strongly resonated with me and, um, you know, the, 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 the common pain points, it sounds like you, you've kind of seen it all. Um, and by the way, if you, you know, haven't seen office space, definitely need to watch it. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a really good one. Um, you know, we've talked, or you've mentioned now a lot about a lot of, you know, the elements of, um, the challenges that a, a distributed team faces. Um, now I want to flip it over and, and ask you, you know, what does the perfect distributed team look like today? That's that, that lives and breathes agile values. Hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if, if you can ever have, have such a thing of perfect of any kind of team, but I, I, I so I would say harking back to the, to the types of distributed teams that I've worked with. And this goes back to the late nineties. So I've been doing this for a long, long time, only really done remote, you know, remote whether it was with developers in Russia or down in North Carolina or places like that. And I think <clears throat> that the secret was having a combination of in-person, like if you want to go somewhere as a group, there are things you can do to sort of break the ice, to establish some um, what you might call team building type activities and not not just uh hey let's go do a high ropes course and you know be scared out of our, our out of our wits together <laughs> but rather also things that are regarding why are we here what are we trying to achieve and let's talk about whether it's you know the product we're trying to build and 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 you know take that as an opportunity to coalesce around something and get enough meat on the bone uh, you know enough skeletons of what what it might look like because there's there's good ways just to start up and have a good foundation and and that's part of what I've been practicing for decades is if you get things set up properly with understanding the just enough requirements understanding and you know, I, I do a lot of domain modeling you know, with UML and things like that just understanding what the problem domain is that we're trying to solve to achieve the the goals we're looking for have a sense of the architecture that we want. So all of those things are collaborative efforts. And so if you have enough of a, of a starting point where you've worked together, you can come in and, you know, let's say you, you even had to go rent someplace because, because nobody lived near an office. So you, you all flew somewhere, right? I mean, that's money well spent in my opinion, because that, that starts the foundation. If you've, broken bread, so to speak, speak, or, you know, drank some beers or, you know, coded together and did stuff. And then you, you go, you go back to your, your, you know, remote offices to take the next steps and then realize when you might need to meet again. <clears throat> so that's really important to understand, you know, that the value of, of establishing that those relationships early on so that you can talk bluntly and I have some good folks that, um, you know, I, I run a production app for firefighters since like 2006. Yeah, very cool. And that <clears throat> that friend that I've worked with, we are so tight that we can, you know, like <clears throat> it makes our conversations, you know, we don't have to beat around the bush. We don't have to worry about offending any, you know, we just boom, cut to the chase. Because we know we're not calling each other's kids ugly. We're just trying to get something done fast. And building that kind of rapport takes time and effort and working together. And that's what I think, you know, a good, successful distributed team, you need to come together every so often and and build those relationships and know when you might need to come together again if something is a problem. But that that I think is 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 a key to success is is it, it shortens the time because you may have heard of things like the 
you, you, the group forms. If this is performance on the y-axis, they form and they're at some performance level. Then they need to storm. And, and before they get back to normal and before they start high performing. So it's this form storm, you know, you get worse when you're storming. And storming means <clears throat> really understanding where, where where we're at. Like when, you know, we argue about, uh, I don't think it should be inherent in some R, and then you're like, oh, bull crap. It really don't. No, no, no. And, you know, again, we're not personal, but we're, we're learning each other's sort of perspectives and we're learning to kind of how to, how to have respectful debates and, and, you know, have some, you know, arguments, so to speak, to get to the better place. And, and I've worked in some companies that are afraid to storm and it feels mm -hmm. like you're never high performing. Everyone's too damn polite. Like, come on. This is, and I love when I worked with, with my Russian colleagues, um, they didn't give a crap if I was one of the founders or, you know, like, and I'm glad cause I don't, I don't, I don't want any privilege. I don't want anything like that. No. Let's duke it out. But you know, whose whose idea, you know, the best idea may the best ideas win. That's you know, that's the that's where you want to get to. And if you can't get there because you don't have enough of a relationship and you tend not to say the things that needed to be said because you're being polite, well, it's gonna take you really long to succeed. And that's a lot of money, and that's a lot of success, and that's a lot of you know, people might leave. So I think the the important thing is if you're if you're remote, you know, that's okay, but Pure remote is, is a real challenge and you have to somehow figure out if you can't get together to learn how to perform and storm um, and then build that 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 sort of the, those bonds face to face, then you need to figure out how to do it over Zoom because mm. you need to do it. Because if, 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 if you don't, if you never have words, then I, I trust me, you're not, you're still not high performing. Yeah, I, I, I feel... Yeah, like I, I kind of feel like, you know, being fully remote now is being offered as almost like a competitive advantage to candidates in the marketplace now because it's a fight for talent. Um, but, you know, if, if I'm understanding correctly, what, what you're saying is that in-person element is so important um, to truly be high performing. And those ideas kind of contradict each other, I feel. Yeah, and um, it's for for you again. Having been remote since the late '90s, I've been doing this a long time. And you know, commuting to Russia is the longest commute I ever did for like three years. I mean, that's a hell of a you know, <laughs> a long flight to commute, commute there. You know, over over seven times or whatever the hell it was. Anyway, um, the I used to say that that being remote is not for everyone. Because it really isn't. I mean, it's you have to know how to work without anybody around and work, right? I mean, it's it's actually it has its own challenges, and yeah, it might be a perk. But I think what you need to do is look at potentially what the perks are and figure out too. Can I can I fold them into? You know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I think that's that that can be a easy mistake to make maybe is is to all right cool we don't have to have office space woo you know that's a lot of savings for the company yeah but maybe that means you need to have some remote workspaces for you know occasional gatherings or you know figure it out but yeah i, I think even you know when and certain businesses might 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 work differently the the like in the beginning of building a product i want to have heavy collaboration and i want to get to a point where it's almost like i feel like it's the the product goes like this where once you get things rolling and you kind of get up get some momentum going yeah you know then yeah people can now the hardest thing to do is be in front of an agile team whether they're in person or remote uh once things are, are rolling and rocking and kicking and you know it's like everything's clicking you know, you can just bang out features left and right, like boom, boom, boom. And um, yeah, you know, okay, then we probably need to be, you know, unless, you know, unless we, we've got ways that we're pairing or things like that. I will say when we're together, mobbing is easier. Yeah, I'm sure there's ways to do it remote, but being in a room, it's a lot, I don't know. It's a lot easier than coordinating over Zoom. You just, hey, yeah. you know what? 
we, we there's this problem let's all you know hang out here after stand up because we're just going to mob on this or you know so it doesn't take a whole lot you know versus anything remote there's a little extra okay got to coordinate and and even different time zones gets even worse um <laughs> so yeah i think it's it's don't get carried away with you know with remote being the uh, the end all be all because i have a feeling there's going to be a back i gear i'm not a, i would wager there will be a backlash yeah and i'll take that back coming from the agile you know the, the person who who does this um day to day who helps teams you know become agile you know i'll, I'll definitely kind of take take your word for it plus for with with my experience too i've seen like nothing really beats a good whiteboarding session that is really hard to replicate online. Yeah, I mean, we have these amazing yeah. tools, right? But nothing quite mimics the real life experience of just having a plain whiteboard and a marker in your hand. Like that power, that communication Great. is so powerful. Great point. You're so right. Cause um, I, I mean, I had just with this, the, this one, co- the one company that I was with for like five years, we we're doing um, high level engineer to order pump manufacturing sales type tool for you know so it was a, my favorite world because it, it blended my um you know fluid dynamics as an aerospace engineer plus my my love for SaaS building SaaS products and, and building new software and things like that and you know even having a young um you know we would we would uh interview at lehigh university and you know we'd have some young graduates that would be working with us and yeah, being able to bring them into the fold, and there were, and there were, there's a room behind where my treadmill was, um, and and you know we'd go in there, we'd have jam sessions on modeling and building out new features, and man, you're right, the the just that that um, visceral three dimensional experience, uh, you know, yeah, Miro's great or any other kind of tool, but it, it ain't the yeah, it's not the same. You're absolutely right. That's a great point. I didn't, I didn't. You know, almost making me, uh, you know, pine for the the, the good old days yeah. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> of being that way. I think the the good old days very much still exist. I think um, even now, uh, it's kind of been a, a refreshing um, time for me to to be with Easy Agile. Like I've I've only been here for uh, just under two months now, and uh, there's a strong in person, you know dynamic and again it's it's optional where if people are remote or they're hybrid or you know they, they need to commute once in a while like it's it's a very understanding you know uh environment um but the once you're in the office or you're in person you kind of feel the um like the effect you were describing like you're you're motivated to like uh deliver for the end customer um you just want to come back it's an addictive feeling of I want to go I want to be back in person and I want to collaborate uh in real time uh in person that's that's beautifully said because I that's uh one of the companies that uh we're beginning to engage with in, in South Africa they're at this very crossroad of struggling with uh everybody's been remote but boy the couple times we were together got so much done and yeah let it's you're describing uh you know you, uh, the 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 flame of the warmth of of delivering and let the moths come to the flame right i mean yeah. let, let that let that you know nurture it and then you know fan the flames of the good and and let people you know opt in and enjoy it and and still sometimes yeah you know i, I gotta stay home i got the kids or the dog what, that's okay too but but giving the option, I think, is where we're going to head, and I believe, I believe the companies that that are able to sort of, you know, build that hybrid, you know, that culture of uh, accepting both, and and neither you know mandating one nor the other, but but building building such a high performing team that that basically encourages people to opt into the things that make the most sense at this at that time and you know i think that that those companies will rule rule the day so to speak yeah yeah absolutely um it's been it's been so nice to chat with you john and i've really enjoyed this um the uh the i want to leave 
the audience off with, you know, with one piece of advice for distributed agile teams from you. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about um, the importance of in-person collaboration. We've talked about the like the principles of the Agile Manifesto. Um, now, I, what would the one piece of advice be? You know, when you're thinking of both, when, when you when you want the Agile Manifestos to be something that's living and breathing in in you know distributed Agile teams, um, what what one piece of advice can you give businesses today, right now, who are going through the common struggles? Uh, what can you tell them uh, as as kind of that 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 last piece of advice? Well, I think um, kind of a, a one phrase that I like to use to sort of capture the manifesto is mind the gap. In my sort of play on words, what I mean is the gap in time between taking an action and getting a response, whether it's what do we do about the office? What do we do about remote? What do we do about this feature? What do we do about this line of code? Right. The gap in time is is it's sort of a, me a metaphor about being humble enough to treat things as a hypothesis. So don't be so damn sure of yourself one way or the other about the office or remote or distributed. Um, but instead, treat things as a hypothesis, be curious and experiment safely with different ways and see what works and don't be afraid to change like it's it's, it's not a life sentence to you got to run your business or your project or your team one way for the rest of your life like now uh, don't tell the boss but work is subsidized learning i've always you know i've always treated it as like i never understood people who just keep doing the same thing because they weren't given permission oh just try it so that's you know my 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 departing phrase would be regarding you know make, making those decisions mind the gap and really be um, humble about making assumptions and, and test your hypotheses and shorten the gap in time between taking action and, and seeing a reaction. Oh, that's awesome! Thank you. I, I really wish we could like let the tape roll and just keep talking about this for for a couple more hours but um well we'll we'll end it right there on that really good piece of advice that you've left the audience off with um john thank you again for for being on the podcast and and we've really really enjoyed uh hearing you and learning from your experiences oh my pleasure anytime happy to, happy to talk another couple hours but yeah I, uh, after some beers yeah it's your, your morning my evening we'll have to work on that yeah. <laughs> I played a little more.